So that's it. And now I will leave the floor to Nicolas for the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Clément and Loha. So let's get started. Um, thanks for the introduction. I can see a few. Well, I can see a few virtual family faces. I think uh, familiar faces in the uh, in the audience today. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's go with so AI assisted core description. We're going to dive into the. Um, it's more of a proof. It's more than just a proof of concept, right? Because this has really been applied in uh, in the framework of an actual um, you know field development plan here. And um, we're going to try and, you know, yeah, deep dive into uh, unsupervised facious classification and uh, what we also call manifold learning in the context of uh, pluviodeltaic shady sense. And in particular, this is this is uh, shady sense from Nigeria. Okay. So as I was trying to touch upon, this is really a real case situation um, that uh, happened in a small uh, EMP company under a constraint time, constraint budget. And uh, it was part of um, <clears throat> the formation evaluation, which itself is a part of a field development plan, FDP, to characterize the heterolytic uh, sandstones of uh, Niger Delta. So the problem statement is rather straightforward. Uh, small team, small budget, no specialist, right? So you don't have any sedimentologist, you don't have any stratigraphist, um, but you still need something to calibrate your volume of shale uh, coming from the logs, right? Something coming from, you know, either neutron gamma ray separation or from, uh, sorry, neutron density separation or gamma ray or, you know, some other techniques. And so there were about 400 feet of core images available, but no core description, right? And as I said, no specialists. So um, the solution, and this is really just uh, one small pitch here, uh, was to create basically in a nutshell, and we're going to uh, dive into the details. Uh, to create a bit, how do you solve this problem? Is to uh, create classes of similar images. You're going to take all the uh, pictures of the uh, core photos, group them into similar classes, and then for every class, we're going to try to identify what you may call their archetypes or their N member. Their, uh, and I'll get back onto this. And then once you've labeled just these archetypes or N members, then you've created a labeled database, which is the holy grail, right? And then you can back propagate that knowledge to the rest of the unlabeled or not annotated images. So the input data is something that I'm sure you've seen uh, a couple of more, more than a couple of times. Uh, those are core images, right? So um, <coughs> uh, core images that can be either, I'm going to put my pointer on, there you go, laser pointer. So either like compact sense like these ones or sense which are a bit more like or heavily biotubated or those here that are a bit more, you know, or quite more uh, rich in shale sediments, if it's uh, clearly laminated. So that's the kind of uh, diversity of sediments that uh, we came across uh, for this um, uh, petrophysical evaluation, right? And um, the idea is that as part of the pre-processing, you're going to uh, create a a database. I'm just going to close this. You know, here we go. That will be better. Here we go. We're going to create a database of like small snippets, like photo patches, right? Of 225 by 225 pixels. And after this, then we're going to uh, basically construct a standardized, harmonized uh, database of these small uh, snippets, right? So every every single little uh, bits and pieces of images. Um, is as I said 225 or 225, so it's about uh, five was 51,529 dimensions or features, right? And for the purpose of this um, exercise, we just only needed to go uh, black and white. Uh, there could be other applications that uh, we could uh, discuss at length afterwards about uh, you know whether go you know going color or so. But for the purpose of uh, this D shell calibration, volume of shell calibration, then black and white was uh, sufficient. <clears throat> so um, to start with, it's uh, just to give you an, a, a flavor of the next steps, right? The main workflow we put together is a five-step workflow. It starts with a transfer learning, which aims at extracting the spatial features from pre-trained CNN, so CNN convolutional neural network, and then um, 
because you just end up with like too many dimensions from the pre-trained CNN, then you need to um, sort of um, re reduce, we say, dimensions, uh, remove redundancy or correlations, you know, that type of thing. And for that, we're going to use uh, two algorithms called autoencoder and TSNE. Okay, and I'll I'll detail come back on this. You know, um, same thing. Uh, the three, the third step is that once you've done this dimensionality reduction. We're going to cluster images, like group them by similarity into like natural classes based on their probabilistic uh, um, density function. And then the way we're going to do this is through something that I may call archetype labeling or n member labeling. So it's annotating the simpler depositional n members. Okay? And the last step, as I said a bit earlier, is it's once you've done the labeling of the easy bits, then we're going to back propagate this to the rest of um, the database of small images. Yeah. <clears throat> well, first step is transfer learning. We've used a, a CNN convolutional neural network that's it's called AlexNet. We could have used some other ones, but this one was quite handy. We also tried VGG at the time. Um, so AlexNet's made of uh, many features, many layers. And so there is a sort of input layer and that's you can see the reason why we went with 227 by 227 it's to accommodate for the design of the cnn and then it's a series of convolutional uh, uh, layers right before you go to the uh, fully connected layers um, at the ends which kind of funnel down to a thousand dimension and then to uh, if you use the alexnet to just do a classification okay which we won't use for this purpose so um, you may see this kind of funnel-like, you know, <laughs> shape as a low to high feature sort of uh, uh, learning process. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the low feature would be more like things like um, uh, colors, you know, major bed boundaries, nodules or stuff like that. The uh, mid-level features would be things maybe like biotubation, uh, sedimentary structures, whether it's more, you know, a laminated or homoki bedding type of thing and then like the high level you know features would be things like maybe under even that scale you know beyond that scale like maybe styler lights or micro fractures so that's the kind of um, you may see this cnn as a superposition of uh, uh, sedimentary structures and textures and properties of different scale okay? so as you go deeper in the network you go also deeper in the scale so at the end as i said there is a layer called fc fully connected layer and there are Three of them. Those are more like conventional uh, neural net type of layers. Yeah, FC6, FT7, FC8. FC so those are really the the one where everything kind of flattens. Okay, and um, every single image, which starts with 227 by 227 pixels, which is about 51,000 pixels or 51,000 dimension, is gradually you may see reduced to uh, 4,096, and then um, a thousand uh, dimensions, right? So we did a few sensitivity analysis to get to know at which uh, layer of the neural net, you know, uh, the valuable information would actually uh, reside or sit. Yeah. So we try to uh, extract the information from FC8, from FC7, but also FC6, you know, as I was uh, pointing out before. And then we found that the one uh, that really helped us for the purpose of this project was uh, FC7, okay? Before it seemed like FC6, uh, FC, sorry, 8, the one right after, right? Um, seemed to compress too much information or some information was lost. And then maybe FC6 uh, had not done the uh, sufficient triage, you may say, prior to uh, FC7. So we take this transfer, we do this transfer learning, we input the little snippets that you've seen before, the thumbnails of pictures of core photos extracted, and then it processes through this uh, network, and then we extract the features at FC7. So basically, we've been already through some sort of a dimensionality reduction from 51,000 pixels or dimension all the way down to uh, 4,096 uh, uh, dimensions. So every single image is now described, described by uh, 4,096 uh, features or dimensions. But obviously, 4,096 features or dimensions is just too much to handle. And sometimes even there, you also have a lot of duplicates or uh, dimensions that don't bear any significant information. So we're going to go through a step of dimensionality reduction okay, before going to clustering. For this purpose, we ran a series, another series of sensitivity analysis with different types of dimensionality reductions. 
It can be through a, a series of autoencoder, like stacked autoencoders, or it can be through more conventional approaches, PCA, which is uh, linear, and uh, um, and TSNI, which is in this case nonlinear um, uh, dimensional reduction technique. So. <clears throat> When you do this sensitivity analysis, you need to kind of achieve, you know, or define what's your objective. And the objective in this case was to uh, group, you know, images into um, distinctive classes. And for that, a uh, useful sort of objective function is the ratio of uh, maximizing the intra-cluster similarity, like making sure that all the pictures you've got are really, really looking like each other. At the same time, making sure that the one that look like each other are really different from the neighbor's one, right? So the other cluster. So that's the maximize also the intercluster difference. So that would be your objective function. So then you can run a sensitivity analysis, which looks at what? It looks at the number of clusters. So you can start with two clusters, three clusters, you know, uh, you, you try different stuff. And then you see if you've been really able to um, to really pinpoint the specificities of these clusters, of these images, together by families that really, really resemble each other. Okay, so for the purpose of this um, uh, project, we ended up going with two autoencoders and TSNI, also for computational reasons, not just for uh, efficiency reasons. I mean, for statistical reason only, but also for computational uh, reason. Having another autoencoder in this case slow down the uh, the whole process. But you can see that there is a very clear sort of um, um, winning process or you know profit you may say to go from one to two and then even between one and autoencoder just you know uh, straightforward plus compared to one autoencoder plus Disney and so forth so as you're going up you really managed this axis tells you oh you did a great job at separating images that really looked familiar and similar to each other from the one that didn't look like each other Okay, so for this, the purpose of this work, we went with two encoders and one TSNI. Um, so that's the three first step, okay, uh, that I just mentioned. I mean, I was at step two, and now we're going to go step three, right, which is the clustering. So what I've just described now were, was how we optimize and, and, and decide step two, dimensionality reduction. So this is what I just repeat what I've, I've, I've done before. We've done feature extraction. You know, we started with 227 pixels by 227 down to 4,000. And then you do a, a series of a dimension reduction where you take your 4,000 plus dimensions to 500 and then 50 and then three. Three is handy because you can see it, right? So you can't see 50, you can't see 500, but you can see three and uh, with colors and patterns, you can even see more, right? But uh, three is quite, is a bit more intuitive. And so in this 3D space where all the images are uh, compressed, you may say, and represented, then this is where we're gonna do a fuzzy seeming type of clustering, and you're going to understand why. I think we've got a little bit of a background noise. If, uh, some, thank you very much. That's great. <laughs> no worries. So, Tisney, so no, not Tisney, sorry. Tisney, you've seen it. It's a fuzzy seeming. And for that, I'm going to do a small digression so that you understand where I'm going. It is a, a digression from the Jungian uh, uh, archetypes. Uh, some of you might have known uh, this great uh, psychologist. Uh, but you, you, you'll get it pretty uh, easily. So the idea here is, um, if we think by analogy, that we're all, you may say, uh, a superposition of behaviors or personalities or characters, etc. right? Where it's, it's very rare to see someone who is like 100% innocent or 100% the explorer, even though they are, right? It's, it would be really like archetypes or, you know, but we're all kind of, um, you know, a superposition of this and members personality. And this personality, like the sage, the ruler, the wizard, they're really easy to spot, right? But what's more difficult to spot is people like, you know, the usual people who can be a superposition, right? And find if you're a little bit like 20% of that, 80% of this and so forth. So that's the same sort of rationale, okay? So here we talked about um, and personality and members, but you can think like rock type into the same way with rock type and members. And by this, you're gonna get what I'm trying to say. What we're looking at now is um, <clears throat> all these little dots are images. All, all these dots are these kind of snippets of core pictures that are now projected into a two-dimensional space. Okay. Initially, remember, every pixel is like one dimension. So originally, you could have one dot in a 50,000D uh, uh, you know, space. But now it's all compressed into that 2D space. 
And what's really interesting in that 2D space is that though if you only look at the points themselves, they look like a big, you know, sort of uh, a sphere, you may say, or here, you know, kind of disk, you know, of points. But when you look carefully and you extract these centers of clusters, you actually see that they, uh, they manifest, they express themselves in a non-random way. Actually, this plot is quite structured. And it's structured in which way? You can see it already, everyone can see that on the right-hand side, after all these projections of images on the right hand side, it's a bit more dark. On the left hand side, it's a bit more bright. And then if you even look here, it's a bit more like stratified. And here it's a bit more compact. So there are things happening after you've projected uh, all these uh, images into a, a compressed 2D or 3D space, um, where the hierarchy and the, topo the topography, the original topography of all the interrelationship between these images, is actually preserved, okay? And they don't, um, they are not being expressed or they don't arrange in a random way. And that's absolutely fundamental. And the reason why they don't uh, arrange themselves in this statistical space in non-random way is also because of the non-random nature of the underlying physical process at play, right? So it's this non-random statistical association is actually driven by the non-random nature of how sediments actually uh, are being deposited. So what's, what I've tried to show here is that you've seen this little dark dots, yeah? and I told you they are images. And then I've selected about 20 clusters, okay? Where I've created 20 clusters. And here, the images that I'm displaying are the, uh, I think it's 20% images, which are at um, the closest to the center of each cluster, okay? So those are the one at the top of the PDF, you may say, okay? So that's what we're looking at now. They're really the core of your cluster, okay? So we've got, that's that's what I've tried to label here. Then all these points will be designed or, or they will be designated as the periphery of the cluster, while these images here would be the center of the cluster. So now we have that, what do we do, okay? So we've identified the center of all the clusters, okay? And when I uh, take all these images from the center of the cluster and I you know, group them and display them, I can find that they're extremely common to each other. And that's the whole point, right? To look at really where is the peak of the PDF in that cluster and <clears throat> in a narrow way, like what are the 20% uh, percent, you know, uh, uh, portion of the images which are really, really uh, similar to each other at the peak of the PDF. And that's that you can see here. If I take this class number two, it's right here. They really look like each other, okay? Class 20, all these extracted images are really looking like each other. This one too, it's like more bio -tubate. This one is more like, you know, wavy lenticular sort of bedding. This is more like shady stuff, you know, okay? So, but you can see that by the fact they look like each other, then they become also a bit easier uh, to um, describe, right? So you have subtle variations, but they all belong to the same end member. And that's that's a bit the beauty of this work. So what do we do? By um, every single, single little group, you know, I'm going to try and label them according to four uh, properties. Again, this is not meant to replace a full-blown core description, uh, rather to just focus on uh, part of the core description, which is fundamental or critical to petrophysics. Okay, there is a context to this. We could have extended this to, you know, like 20 other sort of properties, but again, it was under constraint time, constraint budget, and the aim was really to calibrate the logs. Okay, so it was very fit for purpose. So in that aspect, we looked at, as I said, like four uh, properties, what type of sedimentary structures were these kind of end members belonging to, whether it was more coarse grain or fine grain, and uh, and whether it's more, what was the fraction of the shell. Okay. So this is, now you've got your 20 clusters, you've got your sort of uh, uh, type of categories and properties. And what you do is that you take, for instance, you go cluster by cluster and you only look at the center of each clusters, right? So, and then you go with the team of geoscientists, you know, I mean, we're, the, the people were not that, uh, uh, no, you know, not a big number. You had a petrophysicist and uh, one geologist, one uh, geophysicist. You sit together and you say, hey, what do you think this is, you know? Because here with um, a, let's say, a conventional background of geologists, that's the kind of job that usually you can do to identify what's the fraction of the shell. You know, it's rather straightforward. You don't need to be like, uh, have a PhD on, on, in sedimentology to do this. Again, 
You'll see later on, those are the, the subtleties of the superposition of faces or where really you need a, you know, an advanced sort of uh, experienced eye. But if you if it is to label just the easy thing, the end members, then this is where a more general uh, geologist can do the job. So here you sit with your colleague and then you say, oh, you know, what do you think this is? So uh, here you look at your little catalog of uh, sedimentary structure and you say, oh, this is more maybe uh, horizontal lamination. And what do you think is the coarse, uh, the coarse grain, you know, fraction versus fine grain? So I think, oh, this is more like fine grain. And what do you think is the fraction with a V-shell? Well, there's maybe 20% of V-shell, okay? So this is how you're going to take, you're going to say, so this center of um, cluster is going to be 80% fine grain, 20% V-shell. And then you do this for every uh, cluster. You go, for instance, cluster eight. This one is really, really different. It's going to be more like wavy bedding. So it's, it belongs to this, it pertains to this category. Way more rich in, you know, uh, shale sediment. So it's going to be 70%, this one uh, 30%. And then you go to the next one and so forth, right? So um, I think you, you, got the, you got the idea. So here, instead of um, going image by image or foot by foot, uh, I'm basically just grouping all these similar images. I say, you know, I work 20 times on all these buckets of set of, of uh, similar images. And I say, you know, I think this is, you know, uh, as I said, like lenticular bedding, or this is more fine grain and so forth. And I just do this 20 times and not 400 times like I have 400 feet, okay? Once you've done this, you've basically done what? You've, you've, you've got this table and you've labeled a subset of your whole, you know, core, this, uh, core photo database. You've just labeled about 20% of your uh, core database doing this way, yeah. So <clears throat> then the idea is that we focused on these centroids for the labeling and the annotations. And now what we do, we take this knowledge and it's just a conventional sort of uh, supervised learning. So we've been through uh, unsupervised to supervised. The unsupervised bits help us to gather things by similarity. We really focus on the most similar of the most similar. And then once you've done this uh, database, this subset, this sub database annotation, then you back propagate everything to the periphery of the clusters, okay? So, and for this, we just use a straight, I think, KNN, uh, K nearest neighbors, and uh, to uh, populate or propagate that knowledge into the intercluster area. And the intercluster area beyond statistics represents actually transitional phases from these end members, from the 100% VCL to the 100% compact sense. You know, this is um, this is basically your um, where things get a bit more in the gray zone, right? A bit more subtle. And where, for instance, myself, I would really struggle to uh, identify the uh, the right portion, for instance, of uh, biotubation versus uh, lenticular bedding, and whether you may even have some pirates or you know or uh, all kinds of little things, right? So um, that's that's where we felt that uh, it was a legitimate approach also to use these end members, easy to annotate and to um, to characterize the uh, more difficult to annotate or describe transitional phases. So let's look at it now, how, how, how it looked in the log space, in the, um, in the petrophysical log space. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is a well one, we've got about three wells. Um, you can look at, this is the gamma ray here, okay? And what we're gonna look at is um, the green curve you see here, for instance, right? Is the, the uh, V-shell from gamma ray. The uh, red curve is the uh, V-shell from the separation between a nutrient and density log. And the black curve is the average of uh, both. Right? And then, uh, so that's the conventional like nuclear based, um, you know, um, V-shell interpretation. And the aim of this exercise was to uh, compare it to an independent assessment of V-shell, in this case, pictures. So now really what you're looking at is that is, is that you've completely transferred your images into a log. So you're really looking at a compression of, of information, right? And, and all this log here that you're looking at now, so here, this is the fraction of coarse grain, the fraction here in, in salmon pink, you know, fraction of fine grain, and then here in gray, the fraction of laminated shell, is all coming from your images. So you've, you've managed to uh, have a log of images, okay? So what we're looking at now, okay, we're looking at, uh, we're comparing basically this guy here, the yellow salmon and gray uh, thing, you know, to the black curve mostly, okay. And uh, what it tells us is that most of the time it actually fits quite well, right? 
it, and, and there are a few places where you do see some discrepancies, maybe a bit here, a bit here. And what you uh, actually see, and it makes sense and could be predictable, could have been predictable, that you already have a feel for the fact that the photo-based log, you know, or photo-based VCL has a higher definition or higher uh, resolution than uh, even nuclear logs. Okay? Nuclear logs in average have about two feet resolution. But here you can see that you've got um, you've got behaviors you may say to start with that happen um, even at more rapid scale, you know, or or finer scale than uh, the nuclear logs themselves. And that makes full sense, right? The core description is always uh, um, describing uh, the the core or the rock at a finer scale than uh, than nuclear logs. It would be close to borehole images, for instance. Yeah. So that's the first well. Um, you can see that there is some stuff happening here and there. It's not like uh, you have a major discrepancy. You can see that, for instance, these sort of more low environments, you know, uh, kind of baffle, you know, with shale is 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 fairly well. Uh, uh, reproduced, even this kind of uh, sort of uh, coarsening upward, you know, or, or sequence here, you know, is also uh, fairly well captured. So that's uh, that that type of thing, you know. Let's look at well uh, two. Well, one was made of more like compact beds, you know, and then well two interval B is a bit deeper, and then it's a little more shady. Okay, so same thing again. We're going to compare the black curve, which is the average of gamma ray and neutron density separation with the AI based estimate, which are uh, which basically represents a um, a log of pictures, OK, a log of photos. So here again, um, more than the trends, actually, the values are very close to each other. OK, you can even you know see these ones here. Maybe we missed it a little bit here, a tiny bit as well. But here we're good again. OK, maybe there is a small element here that's been um, um, over. I mean, here is going to be a bit more shale from uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry, it's a bit more sent from the logs and a bit more shell from the email from the uh, core photos, right? Etc. Yeah. So that's um, that's. But overall, you can see here it's like a perfect match. Uh, you've got some bits and pieces indeed, but they're not like uh, game changers. Okay, it's not like it's it's going to tell you that uh, your formation evaluation or petrophysical analysis is a complete uh, you know nonsense or needs really to be revisited. Let's look at the last well, well two interval C even deeper. What's really interesting with this one is uh, also it's the breakdown again, the breakdown of uh, fine versus uh, coarse uh, uh, sands, right? So here uh, the uh, photo based log or the AI assisted core description uh, really tells you something that the logs only would really struggle, which is, you know, what's the quality of the sand that you have here? And here in this case, salmon means, you know, this is the one fine grain, right? Or more on the silty end. So that really tells you something that, yeah, uh, unless you have maybe borehole images or you would do a laser particle size that you, you from core data or sidewall core, then uh, this is really where uh, it brings also some some value because it adds, um, you know, another level of detail um, to your sand description. And that can be also translated into permeability. In the end. Same thing here. Not only you see that this is mostly constituted of uh, fine uh, grains or fine sediments, but also you can see that there seems to be a lot of uh, really fine laminations that the log have absolutely not seen. Okay, so this could impact more than your absolute perm. It can impact also your KVKH, uh, vertical uh, to horizontal perm, and possibly act more as a kind of a baffle, you know, or buyer or or him you know something that would hinder the flow then maybe something you could anticipate there is one place here where um it seems like there is maybe the biggest sort of uh, uh, misunderstanding <laughs> or discrepancy between the two uh where basically the logs are saying no look this is uh, 80 90 percent shale and the image uh seems to say it's 50 percent um you can see the gamma ray is very high here. So technically, I mean, you would have to go back to this interval and really understand why, you know, you think um, there was a discrepancy. We didn't get the time to do it at, 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 uh, at the time of this study, but that's kind of also room for maybe further improvement. Uh, but same thing then for well two, it wouldn't be a kind of a game changer, you know, like for instance, this sand here is where the bulk of the production is coming. This one as well, this one was perforated. Uh, this one too. I, I'll have to recheck, but I believe that uh, even this interval had been tested in, in other wells, 
but they struggle to uh, withdraw any fluid or even have a successful pressure test. So this would tell you that the mobilities are super low and you know that uh, something is happening. So again, it doesn't tell you that this is black or white, right? Because this guy is going to tell you, the nuclear log is going to tell you that um, this is still poor reservoir. The images may tell you, okay, it could be uh, conceivable that you've got something there. But again, you're already on the low end. Um, and those would be like ready, really like radioactive sands as well. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, this is room for uh, uh, future work or improvement, right? But overall, there are two takeaways you can see is that uh, the image based logs uh, provide a higher resolution than the um, uh, nuclear based logs, right? Uh, and hence, it can give you a bit more detail about how thinly laminated are, are uh, the beds, but also from a, a reservoir modding standpoint, you know, what type of maybe KVKH you can expect or uh, or maybe in what direction of the, you know, lower KVKH you can maybe go, okay? That's, that's the idea. And then um, the other thing is that obviously it gives you a fraction of, um, of the fine uh, uh, sense versus uh, uh, coarse sense, which also can uh, help you to estimate the uh, absolute permeability, but maybe also give you some hints about the environmental uh, uh, depositional uh, concept, right, at this depth compared to uh, upper depth, even though from a nuclear standpoint, it looked the same, right? So it, it, it's also a bit more, in this particular case, in line with the understanding of the client at the time, where as you go deeper, then the reservoir quality deteriorates. Yeah? So that's that's other thing. So let's go to uh, next slide. So um, that's the overall workflow, right? And that's the main application that we've seen. Now, um, there are some other things happening that I want to talk to you about is that when you do this clustering, you can also have uh, exotic faces, like things that don't relate to geology, like uh, plugged locations, yeah, or even damaged sections. And those one would, they also look similar to each other. So they will end up being, um, grouped by similarity as well right so in, in that instance you will also have faces of uh, plug locations and faces of damage sections so that's part of the qaqc as well it's what i want to try to, to say uh, so that you make sure that this is not uh, propagated further down the road in the network but also it's a side effect or a byproduct of this type of workflow which enable you to screen out you know and categorize the actual type of rocks, you know, or the preserved rocks from maybe the ones that's uh, for which you will struggle to do any form of interpretation. So that's another sort of byproduct. Where I want to uh, finish, it's this, uh, it's on more the manifold learning. Um, as you know, in the workflow uh, we've used, there is a algorithm or a dimensionality reduction technique called T-SNEAM. Uh, many people might use PCA or nonlinear PCA or some other things. Uh, I really recommend you have a look at um, what uh, Tisney is about. But like any other uh, algorithm, there are all kinds of whistles and bells, knobs to be tweaked, right, to make this algorithm work. And in particular, there is, it's a stochastic algorithm, so you can change the seed number by which it's going to start doing this transform, and also something called the perplexity number or parameter. So when you change this, you change the transform, you change the projection into the lower dimensionality space. And what actually happened is that you remember, uh, even in these plots, things really don't look like they're randomly, yeah? randomly uh, distributed. You remember, it's like darker here, so more shale, a bit more sand here, more laminated, more compact, right? But you can tweak that sort of arrangement or hierarchy uh, by tweaking the way you're going to do that projection from uh, uh, 50,000 uh, dimensions, you know, all the way down to three or two, right? And you can tweak this by the hyper parameters of the TSNI projection. And what's the purpose of this? that you can see that things start linearizing, okay? So here, obviously, on that example, it's highly nonlinear. You can have a feel that by changing the perplexity numbers, like you're tweaking the knob of uh, hyper, uh, the, the, this hyperparameter, you can start uh, projecting things in a different way, all the way to having actually something that's uh, look quite uh, linear, right? From, uh, oh, I'll just go here, from, you can, you can recreate some sort of a V-shell axis almost linear, you know, into the statistical space. And and I, I thought that was something uh, quite uh, quite interesting because usually in, in, in physics, but also in statistics, we, we tend to look for, to simplify things. So I grant you this is more of a convoluted way to get there, but in the end, 
um, if you manage to linearize things, this is a, another holy grail of, uh, of uh, mathematics or statistics, so that you can also, uh, you know, um, simply apply the, a, you know, um, kind of a, a regression. You know, you could find a, a, a workflow where you could end up with a space within which you just have a, um, a linear regression in there to quantify your V-shell. So that's, that would be, or having a V-shell proxy, for instance, you know, uh, if you follow a certain sequence of, of events. So I thought it was uh, worthwhile to show you that you can optimize these projection in a way that they're even less abstract than the thing that they look at first. Okay. Wrap up. So this would be my last slide. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, we're sort of on time, I think. That's okay. So wrap up. Uh, something I like to say is like uh, this technique it helps you to go from drudgery to mastery. And what I'm trying to say is that it really helps trimming down the meticulous, you know, detailed, time-consuming work that um, uh, a, a core description of 400 feet uh, requires. You know, so and in this case, we uh, found a way to group this by you know within 20 classes and have a, a rather systematic approach um, and achieve something close to, you know, 80 to 90% match with log-based uh, VCL, uh, plus giving you more insight than just the nuclear logging techniques. What I want to say also with the fact that uh, it's a systemic approach, uh, obviously it's repeatable, uh, repeatable and, um, uh, you know, compared to more traditional uh, uh, methods. Why is this systemic and more repeatable? Because um, you may know if you do a core description, same thing applies to thin sections, same thing applies to cuttings analysis, and you name it. Um, usually you do it once with like one individual, you know, one professional. Um, here, uh, you can really see this workflow as being one virtual professional. So you could also repeat it, yeah, in, in a way that uh, you could test different professionals. Something usually which is really cost prohibitive uh, when it comes to doing it in the context of a project. So you could swap, right? <laughs> you could test different IDs very, very uh, easily here. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I want to say, where it's systemic as opposed to more sequential process, is that usually uh, you're going to do a core description from top to bottom, bottom to top. You know, different techniques. But very seldom, very rarely, you're going to go back to the top. You know, if you start from top, you know, and uh, apply the learnings of your core description as you went through it. Yeah. Because obviously, you know more at the end of your core description than you know at the beginning. But that knowledge you've accumulated will not be reflected again to the top of the core description because you don't have the time, right? Because it's a very meticulous process and so forth. So here, we're, we don't suffer from this kind of uh, arrow of time, you may say, or time, con uh, constraint, uh, uh, time constraint, right? So you just put everything you know, together. There is no top, no bottom. And then you look for these uh, similarities. And it's um, I, I feel it's, it's also a big uh, differentiator as compared to the traditional sequential approach that uh, usually we have to take in sedimentology. What we've seen as well is a method for unstructured data, right, which is applicable to a number of uh, geo problems. It can be seismic phases, uh, thin section, as I said, cuttings analysis. Uh, same thing, it's, um, this work is not just a uh, pure like proof of concept, POC. It's uh, really business driven. We've done this in two, three weeks. And uh, so that it really fits into the grander, you know, the bigger grand thing, you know, scheme of things uh, for the field development of this uh, company. Yeah. So there were like timelines and, uh, and you know, uh, restricted budget to do this. Um, as I also briefly uh, um, uh, said earlier, one thing I want to mention is that, look, you probably thought, you know, when I go, I'm just going to go here, you know, you probably thought, hey, uh, Nick, you know, when you go here, uh, I don't think that this is 80%, I don't think this is 20%, I think this is 25 and 75, or I don't think this is really, really like horizontal, I think it's a bit lengthy here. So those things are really super easy to um, to modify, right? Because the only thing you have to do is not like to redo the core description, it's just to change this table, and then you back propagate it, and then you go to your uh, traditional log space here, and then you try to see whether the logs have moved. Yeah. So you can do this sensitivity analysis, where in the past, you know, it would be completely uh, prohibited by the time it takes, right, <laughs> to redo a core description and think, oh, you know, uh, what do you think if you would have changed this interval or look at it this in a different way? Here you can do this, right? You can you can do this sensitivity analysis. Um, and finally, as part of this uh, point number two, um, yeah, obviously there's always room for improvement. Like we could have used a different uh, number of classes. Uh, we could have used another new uh, uh, network design. There are like other optimization you 
you could have done on the uh, dimension T reduction. But the, the thing which is important is that uh, it was good enough. And I like using that word. It's it does the it does the job, right? It's good enough. You can always improve. It could be also much worse, but that's um, it was good enough. Yeah. So that's fair enough. That's that's all we needed. Uh, and finally, um, some points about discussing, you know, the pros and cons, you know, limitations and so forth. Um, as you can see, it's not fully automated, right? There is always a human in the loop. Yeah, there is a human in the loop for um, to transpose past that uh, subject matter uh, expertise or knowledge onto, um, you know, uh, this um, uh, the 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 the, the, core, the the description of the rock. There is also a human in the loop for yeah, QC purpose, just to make sure that the output is also coherent with a certain conceptual understanding. And also there is human in the loop for the, all the problematics of responsibility. Like you can't say the computer is responsible for my core description or for the miscalibration between my logs, right? Someone has to own this uh, accountability. Yeah. So that's that's also why uh, I believe that uh, still human uh, should be in the loop. Yeah. Uh, same thing I briefly touched upon. It's not meant to replace an SNE, right? Uh, computers cannot do the problem statements. They cannot tell you whether uh, you achieve your KPI. They cannot do this uh, labeling that we've seen before in the context of unannotated, unlabeled, you know, uh, photos. So there are still places where obviously uh, you need um, uh, subject matter experts. And uh, I like saying this as well. Uh, it could be, and that's a bit provocative, but I think it opens up also the discussion, a solution to expertise shortage uh, or workload. There are many, many clients uh, in the world, many operators, many companies that have like uh, thousands and thousands of uh, feet and meters of core, you know, that are left undescribed. Okay. And we also know that like sedimentology or petrography, though, uh, critical to reservoir characterization and sweet spot identification is something that is not as sexy maybe as uh, you know uh, carbon sequestration or geothermal right or uh, even automation by means of uh, deep learning yeah so uh, we can can we know that there are things that are more trendy than others and uh, core description might have had its hour of glory but not really much anymore it doesn't attract as much talent as it used to be and then the other thing I want to finish with is that um, with this type of techniques um, and more the second part, like the supervised learning bit, um, <clears throat> if you have a very, very good core description somewhere, somehow, and uh, or a stack of core descriptions from a very highly trusted um, sedimentologist who is retired or unfortunately maybe is not with us any longer, well, you can, you can use I think we've got we've got a bit of background noise. If you may, thank you. Mute your mic. So, if you have a you know brilliant stack of core description, you know that has been used uh, that that you feel it's really a trusted source of knowledge from someone who uh, retired or someone who writes uh, is not with us anymore. Well, you can still use it as if that one guy or that one uh, you know um, uh, person would actually redo a modern core description with the eye of, you know, something, the, the expertise of 20 years or 60 years ago, right? So all these things is possible now with this type of technology. So it's a bit like, you know, food for thoughts type of thing, but that's uh, sometimes in the, you know, over the last decades, or there were some expertise that were a bit more pushed, you know, right? A bit more practiced that maybe we've lost to an extent and that these techniques could still uh, enable us to, um, to maintain or preserve. So, um, that's about it for my uh, presentation. I hope uh, you found it of uh, interest and I'll be happy to take some uh, questions from, um, from now on. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Nicola, for this presentation. That was really clear and uh, we'll now go uh, through uh, some questions. So the first one, Laura, maybe you can read it. Yes, so the first uh, comments come from uh, Guillaume Comon from NSG University of Lorraine. And you say, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Nicolas, very nice talk about the discussion on uh, VSH difference between the image-based forecast and log-based one. I like uh, your point that the base present at some levels can help you ask interesting questions. Uh, do you have tried this on data sets where you could have some ground truth validation, for instance, based on course? 
Yeah, in the, in this case, uh, the ground truth validation, Guillaume, was the <laughs> the consensus of the team. <laughs> but I know it's not the answer you you're after. But no, we didn't have a um, um, we didn't have a um, <clears throat> even I was thinking on this one. We didn't have even thin sections, right, or cuttings that could be cross referenced uh, for this particular work. So that's also where uh, we uh, kind of you know lagged or or yes, yeah, suffered from this availability of data and hence why this uh, approach was really necessary to make sure the logs were not uh, misreading uh, the reservoir quality. So on this one, no, and even after the fact, you could, you know, we, we didn't have any new data acquisition that we could benchmark, but that's uh, that's a valid point. And, uh, but you, you see, uh, uh, Guillaume, also, if, you, if we had had the um, grand truth well, depending on the quantity, then we could have used it in a supervised way, you know, which would also have altered the, the, the technique. So it's, it opens to <laughs> all kinds of other questions. <laughs> I hope that answers your, uh, your question. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, another question from uh, Nargis IFP School. Uh, thank you a lot for the lecture. I wanted to clarify here. You were clustering only features that were extracted uh, previously from CNN, or you were defining the size of image yourself? Right, because we've um, yeah, yeah, because basically we've used a pre-existing network. Um, we were um, constrained uh, by the input dimensions of this existing network. Yeah. Had we used another network, we would have like used VGG or some you know uh, like Google Net or that type of thing, you know. Uh, you would uh, not use like 227 by 227 to, uh, you know, uh, resize your images, but something else. Had we used also our own network, you know, um, it would have been uh, different than 227 by 227 pixels. Uh, so it's really constrained by the um, the um, uh, network architecture that you use for transfer learning. It's uh, there are pros and cons, but. Again, for the purpose of this project, uh, it didn't seem like we need to be anywhere higher than 227 by 227. I think we could even have gone low uh, with a, another type of network. Uh, it could have been even even faster. But uh, transfer learning is super fast. It's just happening, you know, like this. So it's it's also one benefit. Maybe you could say, oh, you can always adjust. But at the same time, the, you really leverage the um, the features that have been learned on like millions of millions of pictures um and and what's really interesting it still fascinates me is that alex net's not trained on core descriptions obviously on these kind of specialized photos but the features like you know edges texture color curves and these things are still um uh coherent right they're still um uh, valid whether you train this type of uh, CNN on dogs, cats, and cup of teas, as opposed to uh, uh, rocks, right? So that's that's quite um, also fascinating. Um, we have another question from James Omek from ISP School. He says, "Thank you, Nicolas, for your presentation. It was encompassing and very detailed. You picked the compressed representation of your image." at FC7 and coding uh, layer. Is there a way to uh, quantitatively evaluate why you stop at FC7 instead of going to the next uh, layer? Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I don't have it there, but that would be the, the same kind of ID that what you see here, right? You could, um, you could, um, how did we do this? We tried also FC6 and F FC8. Um, what I can recall from the top of my mind is that um, you wouldn't, in the end, you would not be able to separate clusters in the same meaningful way than at FC7. Uh, it might sound a bit broad as an answer, but um, if you just run blindly, let's say, a, um, you're a fuzzy seeming, you know, on this, uh, and then you try all these sensitivities, then you, you'll see that. Um, when we use FC8 and FC7, you group them. You you would never get this sort of pattern actually. It it would be um, I can't recall it from the top of mind, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be as structured actually. Same thing here. You you wouldn't uh, be yeah you wouldn't be able I remember to discriminate between each cluster as well as with FC7. So to answer your question, there is a bit of a visual QC on this, uh, James. So um, you would run your pipeline. 
and then see what would be the outcome. And for that, obviously, you would need a little bit of subject matter, you know, expertise or domain expertise. But I think even some basic geology uh, knowledge would, would do uh, in this case. So uh, the statistical answer is cluster discrimination. And the QC would be uh, based on uh, uh, whether these clusters also make sense or are similar enough from a geological standpoint. And when we use FC7, sorry, when we use FC6 and FC8, it was not as meaningful as FC7. Hey, uh, another question from uh, Pham Wong Van. So I have been doing unsupervised clustering for a while. Is TISNI a component in the process? Is t uh, sorry, is TISNI slower, right, than some other methods? That's what I, is it the same question we're reading no. or? Uh, no, it's written, uh, is TISNI a component in the process? Oh, I think there are different questions than that. Yeah, oh, it, it's it's maybe you missed the... Uh... The one before that you ah, yeah. saying. Sorry. Right. So, okay, I'll answer both. Uh, yes, okay, I can see both questions. Okay, I'll answer uh, is TISNI slower than some other methods? Uh, yes, TISNI is not the fastest one. Yeah. So, um, there, same thing, there are pros and cons to TISNI. Um, uh, if you look at the literature, you'll see that it goes through some sort of iteration process that, is, that might not be always effective. If you want to do like uh, real time interpretation, for instance, I, I won't really advise to do TISNI, for instance, yeah, uh, uh, because TISNI is also stochastic. If you don't use the same exact SID number, then it will lead to another transform. Okay, so there, there are other other like pros and cons. Yeah, it's um, so I hope that's uh, and it, it's really again the pipeline, you know, the uh, sequence of things is really uh, fit for purpose. Yeah, I, I would I would not use this for as I said. Uh, <clears throat> something if you build a web app you know and they need a on the spot answer um, you would need some series optimization of this thing but if it's something that's um, uh, like comes on top of a more like traditional evaluation process then uh, you know I would uh, consider this thing and your second question uh, Van been uh, doing it what is this um, maybe this one would answer your question, I hope. This is, yeah, this is one component, right? So there are other um, dimensional and T reduction techniques like autoencoder, PCA, and so forth. And that's like one uh, building block. No, it does not cluster. Um, uh, remind me what is used to, cl yeah, cluster is fuzzy semi. Yeah, I think that should answer your question. So, no, T is a, is a type of projection that, um, honor the hierarchy and the um, really the topology, how all the points are uh, in this, let's say 50D or thousand dimension new space. Uh, the idea of these things to try to bring them to a something you can rather visualize in 2 or 3D while still keeping their their sort of uh, uh, relation, you know, in that uh, higher dimensional space. So that's the idea of these things. And uh, we have yeah, another question from uh, James. Uh, we we'll say, uh, is it necessary to attach a decoder and uh, to the network and use its uh, output to confirm it's uh, your input image where well reconstructed? I'm not sure if I get this one, uh, James, just like any, uh, because here it's I'm not, it's not like a GAN, you know, or a UNET, uh, there's, I mean, I, that's the way I understand your question, right? Maybe I understand the, the, the wrong way, but there are, I, I feel there are a couple of things. Uh, the decoder would come in the autoencoder bit, so we see, you know, uh, there's encoder, decoder, and that's, uh, in this case, the aim of the autoencoder auto is to make sure you can describe the image with a lower number of features uh, while still reconstructing it through the decoder but that's kind of you can't well, yes you, you can re remove these two bits together but that defeats the purpose in that in that sense of the auto encoder uh, but in this particular workflow uh, there was no image reconstruction like you would have in a um, even some very particular type of uh, cnns but more like gans you know generative adversarial networks or um, uh, or uh, units as well these kind of funnel in funnel out uh, cnns so I don't know. I, I hope I answered it. Maybe I didn't understand properly the question. OK, 
okay. It seems that's okay, actually. Okay, so uh, last question from James. <laughs> My final question is on the number of clusters. Yeah. How balanced is the data point in each clusters? Do we have some clusters with fewer images or data points such that they could be merged with other clusters? Yeah, so yeah, I could come back on this. Um, about the amount of data points per cluster, um, I don't have that information with me, but uh, generally speaking, I think they were fairly well balanced. Uh, but for this, you'll just have to uh, take my word. You know, I don't have anything to uh, to uh, demonstrate this. However, on your other part of your question, um, you'll see. And let me uh, have a look at this again. Yeah, like you see, uh, cluster seventeen is. Um, Horizontal lamination, no coarse grain, 10% fine grain, 90% shale. If you go to cluster 12, it's the same thing, right? So it's going to be uh, same sedimentary structure, coarse grain, you know, fine grain, and a fraction of shale. So here you can say, hey, you know, why do you do? <laughs> why do you have this redundancy? Yeah. This is a pragmatic approach here. Okay. Um, it's you. The way to answer this is you have to look at the cost of being redundant be, be, uh, as opposed to the cost of missing something out. So in clustering, there is never like a perfect answer there or very, very rarely. Okay? But there is never like a one size fits all or a perfect number of, you know, number of clusters that you should really, really hold on to. Okay. So here, because we admit that there is not such a um, absolute perfect number of clusters, you know, that's is carved in stone forever. We would rather take the risk to do a slightly bit more of work, you know, um, to be on the safe side and make sure we've labeled all the little subtleties than trying to be a bit more conservative with maybe 15 uh, uh, clusters and say, and, and say, yeah, okay, look, all my clusters are very uh, different from each other, but have little means then to show that maybe the 16th ones would also have been different from the 15 others. So it's very, here you have to look at it in this pragmatic way, like what's the cost of, um, um, of doubling up, you know, the work compared to the cost of missing, missing it out, yeah? And again, in this case, this particular case, uh, adding one more line and asking the team around, you know, what do you think about this set of images is really a minor sort of uh, amount of time and effort that you're going to spend maybe an extra minute, you know, uh, for the whole rest of the workflow, as opposed to maybe having missing a, um, a facies or a type of uh, biotubation, you know, or, or so forth that may alter your KVKH or, you know, um, uh, be the responsible for some mismatch between nuclear approach and uh, image-based approach. So I hope that answers your question, but that's it's a deliberate uh, practice in this particular case to make sure we're on the safe side. And given the fact that it doesn't cost much to slightly do a bit more work, uh, even though it's a bit more duplicate, it's it's uh, it's it's fine. So to answer your question, these two faces, yes, could have been merged. Uh, and I think there are uh, another pair that could have been merged. Uh, that's that, that's uh, that's correct. Um, but again, it's it's not like a um, um, a game changer, right? So that's um, that's what I want to emphasize. Okay, thank you, Nicola, and thank you all for the for the questions. Actually, uh, the the yeah the webinar was quite interesting, and thank you a lot for that. Uh, so I think it. So very if you do not have uh, any requests or something. <laughs> uh -huh. Merci Nicolas. <laughs> okay, uh, avec plaisir. Merci beaucoup. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Nicolas. Thank you for inviting me. Cheers. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Anytime. Salut Nico, à la prochaine. Merci encore. Hein.